Hello and a warm welcome to everyone joining us today for this first session of the brand new Corpus Curiosum lecture series. Uh, just a quick few notes before we start. Um, first, the introduction and main talk of each session will be recorded and may be published. So um, your personal video as well as discussion at the end will neither be recorded nor published. Um, second, for the Q&A session, we kindly ask you to send your questions at any point during the talk via the Zoom group chat. Please set everyone as a recipient um, and our guest speaker will answer your questions after the talk. Uh, lastly, we aim to end latest at around 4.30 p.m. UK time, depending on where you are situated. Moving on, as some of you might know, the name Corpus Curiosum is derived from the Corpus Callosum, a tough nerve tract with hundreds of millions of external projections that connects to two brain hemispheres. Uh, and just like the Corpus Callosum, um, we as Corpus Curiosum want to, want to connect different fields within and beyond neuroscience to communicate, debate, and engage. This lecture series is specifically designed to expose early career researchers to new aspects of neuroscience and to promote critical thinking. About us, uh, we have four early career researchers ranging from postgraduates to postdoctoral positions based in London, Madrid, and Barcelona. The diversity of us as researchers in both position, location, and interests reflects the diversity we aim to see in you, our target audience. And we are more than glad that we are on a fantastic way to reach this goal. You, the audience, come from 17 uh, different countries across continents, uh, from Australia to Ecuador, the Philippines, and we're really glad that we are reaching you. Beyond that, you're affiliated with over 35 institutions and companies worldwide. Seeing this diversity is fantastic, um, and our aim is to improve this even further. Finally, the most interesting part. Um, I want to introduce you to uh, Ines Abado Rodriguez, who is not only speaking today, but also part of our lovely team. She studied psychology, psychology then obtained an MSc in Neurobiology and Cognitive Neuroscience at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. And she then continued to do her second MSc in Mind, Language, and Embodied Condition Recognition at the University of Edinburgh. As a PhD student, she studies schizophrenia at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, UCM. And today we're hearing from her about our mental disorders, malfunctions of the brain. The stage is all yours, Ines. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the nice presentation, Faisal. I hope everyone can see my screen. Can I have like some? Okay, perfect. So yeah, um, wait one second, I'm gonna minimize this. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you so much for the presentation and for attending this talk. Uh, as Faisal said, I'm Ines Avalo Rodriguez, and we are here today to reflect on what are mental disorders and if they can be understood as malfunctions of the brain, right? I belong, as Faisal said, to the Universidad Complutense of Madrid, that's where I work, and I'm financially supported by La Caixa Foundation. I let my email address uh, in the previous slide so we can like have a discussion later or be in contact if you guys want. So um, this is a brief summary of the points we will be addressing in this talk. I'm going to start introducing the problems uh, existing in the field. And then I will introduce the neurocentric conceptualization, as well as the problems that such a way of conceptualizing mental disorders has. Afterwards, I will offer an alternative conceptualization and I will clarify exactly what I mean with that and what I don't mean with that. And finally, we will uh, talk about the consequences of such an alternative view and we'll have questions uh, to discuss later in the questions and answers. So let's start. Before everything, I wanted to say that I apologize from the beginning because I know that this is actually a really broad topic and we don't have that much time. So I'm gonna be doing uh, strong simplifications at some point. Uh, this is just because of the time. Of course, we can discuss everything later, uh, but I wanted to state that from the beginning, right? So uh, let's see where we start. Uh, this is an example of a simplification that I was mentioning. Uh, I brought this slide just to start reflecting on where do we come from, right? Uh, I recommend these three books. These, the first two talk about the history of medicine and the last one talks about the history of psychiatry. 
And this slide is just to say, to reflect on how we started to deal with the problem of sickness, right? So the idea would be that at the very beginning, we started to see people getting sick. And there was a time in history in which we started to say, oh, wait, maybe that's actually not caused because of an external God or like God's like provoking these symptoms, but maybe actually they are suffering from this because they have something in their bodies, right? And that's how the medical paradigm started. And from this long perspective, it's how we, like, that was a perspective that we were having when we started to realize that there was such a thing called mental disorders, right? So this is just to say that um, we were coming from this traditional and long perspective to address illnesses, right? And well, what's the medical paradigm? Basically, and really short, the idea with the medical paradigm is that you have things that you can observe, which are called symptoms, right? And they are important because we track them to find or to discover the biological cause that it's underneath them, that it's provoking them, right? Um, so the, of course, the biological causes can be really broad and really different, but we always have the same idea. You have like symptoms, you track them to find the biological cause. And the combination of these two factors, the biological cause plus the symptom, is what we call disease, disorder, syndrome, illness. Um, there's a long debate in philosophy trying to, like that talks about when to use which term. I'm not gonna enter into that debate in here in this talk. I will just for the sake of simplicity using all these terms like uh, indistinctly, right? But the idea is uh, kind of clear, right? You have a biological cause provoking the symptoms. And in this way, the treatment is normally directed to like normally targets the cause because if you eliminate the cause, you eliminate all the problems. Sometimes you also have treatments that are directed to the symptoms either because the biological cause cannot be solved or because the symptoms are so bad themselves that it's good trying to mitigate them, right? Uh, well, recently there has been an attempt to have a broader picture of the whole thing, which has consisted basically in trying to add uh, previous causes. So I'm sure that we all are quite familiar with this, right? Because the idea would be, okay, you have fever because you got a virus. Is there actually any way that we can avoid you having the virus in the first place, right? And that's how all this idea of preventing medicine exist, exists, because sometimes it's actually cheaper, uh, oh, cheaper, <laughs> cheaper or easier to address the previous causes and to invest in preventing medicine, right? But still that doesn't modify the paradigm because at the end of the day, you always have the biological cause provoking the symptom, right? Well, the same can be applied to the mental, to mental disorders. And that's what happened like during a lot of years. And it was just assumed implicitly, right? So the idea would be treating uh, medical disorders in the same way. So you would be having symptoms, in this case are different, right? You can have like not leaving the bed symptom or hearing the voices, voices symptom. And you assume that there's a biological cause underneath them, provoking them. And you can of course add a broader picture of the situation in which you can talk about uh, previous causes like beauty standards of the society or stressful events or traumas. But at the end, you would be having the same linearity, right? Uh, this is just to say, like to say that mental disorders over a lot of years were treated as medical illnesses, right? Implicitly. So you would be having the same thing, symptoms, then a biological cause, and then previous cost, uh, causes belonging to the context, right? And that's how the DSM started. Like the DSM is this, uh, diagnostic, this uh, diagnostic and statistical manual of mental diseases. And it's basically where all the disorders are registered. And it's born from this medical paradigm, right? And it tries to imitate what other manuals in medicine do. Okay. However, we started to realize over the last decades that such a view had problems because for instance, DSM is a theoretical with regards to etiology, which is a problem because the disorders appearing in DSM, contrary to what happens in the other uh, fields of medicine, are not uh, like, like they are not uh, showing any etiology, any common etiology, but they are just like summarizing the symptoms. So that's the first problem. But we also have, as a consequence of that, high comorbidity, 
high heterogeneity, and also, and that's the important thing, lack of results in research. Uh, this quote belongs to Insel, which is the, was the president at the time in which he said this, of the National Institute of Mental Health of the States. And basically, he even highlighted the problem that even if we have been researching on this field for decades now, we haven't been able to find bio biological markers that uh, are like clinically actionable. So this all makes us understand that we have a problem in the field and that we need to reflect on what we are doing, right? So that's how the solution is reflecting on the conceptualization of mental disorders. So like taking a break and saying, okay, what are we doing? And that's how we have two possible conceptualizations. You, we can understand mental disorders as from a neurocentric conceptualization, which is basically the same than the medical model, but made it explicit. Um, so instead of simply assuming it implicitly, you make it explicit, which that's the neurocentric conceptualization. An alternative, we have an alternative, an alternative conceptualization that we will be discussing today. Uh, just on a quick note, I wanted to say that there has been another attempt of solution, which is the research domain criteria. I'm not gonna say anything about this uh, solution in here. I just brought these papers. The first one is the one that presents uh, the research domain criteria. And the second and the third one are critics towards like, uh, well, these authors criticize this solution. Just for the sake of our talk, I would say that the research domain criteria actually shares the same conceptualization than like the research domain criteria is based on a neurocentric conceptualization. We can see here Kutberg and Kutberg. So just, this is just to say that the same things that we are gonna be criticizing of this uh, conceptualization can be also applied to the research domain criteria. Okay, that said, uh, what's the neurocentric conceptualization? Um, I love this paper because it's super straightforward. It was written by Insel and Kutler. And yeah, it kind of says it from the beginning, right? It was published in Science and the title says everything. Brain disorders precisely what the authors recommend to do. It's redefined mental disorders as brain circuit disorders. And as we can say, as we can see, um, this is just an update of the medical paradigm because this is the scheme that we had before, right? So the idea is that we highlight the role that the brain malfunction has. So of course you would still have, for instance, the influence of genes, but what they are suggesting is that at the end, everything alters the brain, creates a malfunction, and that's how you have the symptoms, right? So let's try to analyze the data that we have uh, supporting or not this view. Um, if this is the case, if actually we can understand mental disorders as brain disorders, we need to meet three requirements, which are we need to encounter a brain alteration, we need to say that that brain alteration is a brain malfunction, and we need to say that the brain alteration has a causal role over the symptoms that we observe. It's quite simple, right? Because if we are assuming this model, that means that you need to find a biological alteration which is malfunctioning in that it's provoking the symptoms. That's what it says, right? If this was actually the case, um, then neurology would end up absorbing psychiatry and clinical psychology because neurology basically studies brain disorders. So if it's actually the case that mental disorders are brain disorders, then psychiatry and clinical psychology are doing the exact same thing than neurology. So there should be this uh, these fields would be the same, right? However, it seems that it's not the case because the neurocentric conceptualization faces some problems. First of all, first question, is there always a brain alteration in mental disorders? I brought this paper, which is actually quite cool. Um, in the paper, the quote by Insel that we commented before uh, appears, right? So basically, I, I love this quote because it's written by Insel and even the same Insel. So this is just a fact that in research, we haven't been able to, be, uh, to find specific biological markers for every single uh, mental condition. I brought an example of my own uh, research topic, which is schizophrenia. I really recommend this paper because it's, it's also really cool. And in this paper, the author presents this table in which you can find, according to research, all the different parts of the brain than that had been proven to be altered in schizophrenia. 
And this is quite telling, right? Because if we read in, if we pay attention to this list, we can find that basically all the brain has proven to be altered in schizophrenia. And the most interesting thing is that it's not that every single schizophrenic has the same alterations, but in, in all the brain, but that some people suffering from schizophrenia would have these parts altered, other ones would have these parts, other these ones, other this one and this one, which means that just by looking at the brain, you cannot really tell if the person is suffering, what kind of mental disorder the person is suffering. So that should make us reflect. Like if we have been spending decades on researching on this, how is it possible that we didn't find any specific, specific, specific <laughs> brain alteration for each condition, right? So that's the first question. The second question, let's just for the sake of argument, let's assume that it's just a matter of time and that eventually we'll find brain alterations specific to every mental disorder. Can we actually say that such a brain alteration is a malfunction? And that's where we can introduce the work of Mark Lewis. Uh, he's a neuroscientist. And I really recommend this book. It's really good. And he also has this paper that he published a couple of years later, which is kind of a summary of a book, of the book. And basically he does the same thing that we have, that we are doing in this talk, but focusing on addiction. So what he says is that he reviews the brain disease model of addiction. And he uh, argues that he thinks that it's flawed because brain changes in addiction are similar to those generally observed when recurrent highly motivated goal seeking results in the development of deep habits. So this is quite telling because as he says, if you look just at, the, at a brain, you cannot tell if the person is addicted or has fallen in love. And if we don't want to say that someone that has fallen in love has a malfunctioning brain, we cannot say that someone that is addicted has a malfunctioning brain because the changes that appear, like that happens in the brain are actually the same, right? And then he also mentions this learning cycle. Uh, so keep it in mind because we will get back to that later. And finally, and more importantly, because I'm sure that at this point, maybe some of you guys are like, okay, somehow Ines doesn't like the word malfunction, but let's assume that we have a brain alteration and that's specific to a brain disorder, and it's just a matter of time that we'll find it. This is the, like, this point, is, it's crucial, right? Because the point is, can we say that such a brain alteration is last malfunction is the cause of mental disorder? And that's critical, right? Because we all remember the famous study of the taxi drivers in London, and we all are familiar with the terms of neuroplasticity. So brains, we all know that brains are supposed to change, that they are designed to change. And this is the issue, right? That we know that brain can like modify a behavior that modifies a context, that, but sometimes we forget that it also works the other way around. So context can modify behavior that can in turn modify the brain, right? And this is quite telling because let's imagine that you observe someone uh, not leaving her bed because she's really down and she's not able to leave her bed, right? And you find that she has low level of serotonin. Can you say, oh, she, like, she has low level of serotonin and that's why she's not leaving the bed. Can you actually say that? Because it can be also the other way around, right? It can be say that, oh, she's not leaving her bed and that's why her low levels of serotonin decreased, like her levels of serotonin decreased, right? So this is just to say, that even if you find a brain alteration, you need to think if it's actually the cause or the consequence, right? And of course the consequence would be also affecting the behavior, but this is just to say that it's not as simple as this linear model, right? Um, okay, so because of all these reasons, um, we can think that the requirements of the neurocentric conceptualization uh, has like have some problems. And that's why we can start questioning if actually um, this conceptualization is correct according to the existing data. But if it's not correct, which conceptualization should we have? And that's where uh, the alternative conceptualization happens. Uh, this slide is just to say that the neurocentric model has been criticized from different fields in academia. So it has been criticized from neuroscience, like Lewis, we already talked about him, or this Sutherlow that was the one of uh, writing the, the paper on schizophrenia, right? 
but it has been also um, like criticized by philosophy, for instance, and the historic of nation framework, which is uh, all the time showing how we shouldn't have an Eurocentric conceptualization of both mind and mental disorders. And it has been also criticized by computational psychiatry, for instance, especially in this, uh, this um, model inside of this field, which is network theory. So all of these fields are saying kind of the same, but the conceptualization I'm gonna be offering is the one that behavior analysis gives. Uh, and this is not to say that actually these fields are saying things that are like different. This is just to say that actually to some extent they are all sharing the same view. Actually there's this paper that shows how behavior, like the similarities between these two frameworks or when I was actually in the University of Edinburgh, my master thesis was relating these two uh, fields. So this is just to say that um, from different perspectives, we are kind of all getting to the same point. So what's behavior analysis saying? What's this alternative conceptualization? Well, we could summarize it like this. Mental disorders should be understood as a network of symptoms that are caused caused by a learning process whose long-term consequences are unadapted. Let's try to understand what that means. Um, I brought two examples of a mental disorder. Uh, they appear in the DSM. So one of them is anorexia, the other one is agoraphobia. These are the numbers for, of the DSM. So the idea would be that you have these symptoms uh, that also appear in the DSM. They are gaining weight, body image distorted, production of ingestion. And the idea is that these symptoms would be a consequence of a learning process and they conform a network, which means that these symptoms don't happen in isolation, but they are feeding each other. For instance, you have a body image distorted and that's why you're afraid of gaining weight. And that's why you stop eating, which in turn influence the kind of body image that you have, right? So this is just to say that the symptoms don't happen in isolation, but they are feeding each other. And that's why they conform this network. That for behaviorist analysis, for behavior analysis, this network is called functional analysis. And the same could be say about could be said about agoraphobia, right? You have again symptoms and they are like feeding each other. And that's why they conform this kind of network, right? Okay, the second part of the definition whose long-term consequences happen to be this unadapted. Um, okay, wait one second here. So this is just to say that every time that we learn something, it's because it works in short term. Otherwise, you simply don't learn it. The problem with mental disorders is that you learn something that worked in short term, but in long term happens to be unadapted. For instance, let's, let's take the example of anorexia, right? You grow up in a society that tells you that if you want to be successful, you need to be thin. So that's why you start learning uh, to give a lot of importance to your body and to be afraid of gaining weight and all that stuff. So if you stop um, eating and you actually get thinner, that would work in short term. Because of course you're gonna need, like if you start losing weight, you're gonna start feeling okay. And maybe your self-esteem is gonna increase. And maybe you came from a low self-esteem situation and that's gonna like, kind of work in short term, right? The problem arises when all this network is created and that st stops being uh, like functional in long term, right? The same thing could be said about agoraphobia. Maybe you're suffering panic attacks and that's why staying in works because you avoid all the anxiety that you have when you leave your place. The problem is that as a consequence, you stop going out like, and then you develop this agoraphobia uh, situation, right, of network. Uh, well, this point reached, I have to make an, uh, an explanation or a, a declaration because at this point, all my clinical psychologist friends suffer a lot because they are looking at this slide and they are like, sorry, uh, what is this exactly? This is a functional analysis and they suffer a lot because it's like, that's a, like a really big simplification. And of course it is, but that's why I started the talk apologizing from the beginning, because this is actually how a functional analysis really looks like. And this is not even like the functional analysis of one of the disorders that we mentioned, but just one of the symptoms that we mentioned, right? And this is just to say, well, I brought, I put this slide on the PowerPoint 
not to explain it because that would take a lot of time, uh, just to A, make my friends happy, but second, to show how this is actually a really complex thing. So if I brought this, uh, this nice picture, it was just to make it clear, but we are not saying, when we say that this is a product of a learning process and that this is related to this, we are not saying that at that level of unspecificity. We are actually talking about things really and strongly relating from one place to another and trying to understand exactly the learning process that is underneath of every single behavior, right? So let's clarify some concepts. Um, when we talk about behavior from this perspective, what we actually mean is the interaction between an organism like a human and the environment in which that person lives, right? And learning, we understand it as the process that goes, that allows us to modify and to change from one behavior to another one. Um, so the idea is we are immersed in a context and we are all the time learning or trying to learn how to get adapted in a better way to the context. So that's why all the time like interacting with them, with the context and like, trying to learn how to get better adapted the problem of mental disorders would appear when the long-term consequences of that learned behavior don't work, right? And now we get to the most difficult part of the talk, which is this one. So um, the crucial point in here is, okay, we have a person, so an element interacting with another element, and we have an interaction among them, right? So we have one element, another element interacting. So the question is, can we enclose the interaction inside of one of the parts that it's interacting? So not only one of the parts, but one of the parts of one of the elements that it's interacting, right? That's the question. Like, can we enclose all of that inside of a brain? And well, this, this is a long debate in philosophy. It's called the emergence problem. And I recommend these readings because actually, um, yeah, they are really good. But basically the idea is that, well, this idea has been applied in all the different levels of complexity of the matter, but applied to neuroscience, which is what we are talking today. This problem has been named the neural sufficiency principle. And this idea has been rejected by some authors. I strongly recommend the first paper and the second uh, reference, which is actually a chapter of a book. And basically um, what they say is that you can't you can't take the whole picture just by looking at a brain. Um, we can discuss it later on because I know that this is hard to, to get at the beginning, but the idea it's, um, let's imagine a movement, right? So uh, a movement can be also understood as an interaction among an organism and the context, right? So let's imagine that you have uh, someone that is grabbing a glass of either water or a poison. So the person is actually either wanting to live more and survive or either killing herself. The question is, just by looking at the muscles of her hand, can you know if the person is having one or the other beverage, right? And this is not to say that the person is not moving the hand or that muscles are not changing. Of course, that's, that's happening. The question is that just by looking at her hand, you cannot get what kind of interaction is happening. It's the same idea that Lewis was saying, right? Just by looking at the brain, you cannot tell if the person is addicted or has fallen in love. So that's kind of all this idea, uh, yeah, what this idea means basically. Uh, we can discuss it later on if you guys want, but long story short, the idea is that for behavior analysis, neurological disorders are something completely different from mental disorders. In both cases, you would have like symptoms, uh, but in neurological disorders, you would be having a biological cause, while in mental disorders, the cause is a learning process. And the role of the brain in both situations is different. In neurological disorders, the brain is the cause, while in mental disorders, the brain is the consequence, right? Um, so this is slide is just to summarize and to revise the requirements that neurocentric view was not meeting according to the existing data and how these requirements are not a problem from the behavior analysis view. Uh, because the first one, right, was to encounter a brain alteration. For the learning view, uh, this is not actually a problem. Here. 
this is actually not a problem because um, it depends on how long and strong the learning process is, right? So if the learning process is actually really long and really strong, you might find a brain alteration. Otherwise, maybe you won't find any brain alteration. Same thing, uh, next point. Brain alterations are a brain malfunction. That was a problem from the neurocentric view, but it's not from the learning view because the learning view would be saying that brain is not malfunctioning, that the long-term consequences of the learned symptoms are the one unadapted, but the brain is perfectly functioning. And finally, the brain, like the brain having a causal role for the learning view, the cause is the learning process. The consequence uh, would be the brain alteration that you might be finding. So this point reads, uh, I'm gonna spend like the last minutes of the present presentation explaining and clarifying what I am not saying, because I know that this view is kind of really difficult to get at the beginning. Um, and it can lead to come some, yeah, like conflicts and problems. So the first time, like normally when you deny the role that biology is having, like the causal role that biology is having over mental disorders, I normally get this answer, which is somehow like, okay, I get that learning is important, but you know that at the end of the day, everything is biology, right? So, or, or are you saying that there's something called mind that it's kind of operating or something? And I know where this, this is actually a really interesting point. And this question comes actually from philosophy. And that's where, why I wanted to talk about this guy. He's the one to blame. He's called René Descartes, as you might know. He, well, he was famous because of a lot of different things, but especially because of his ontological proposal, because basically he was a dualist, which means that he thought there were two different kind of natures. One of them was like the body and the other one was the mind. And that's to say, he, with this, this, he meant that the laws operating in one of these worlds were totally different from the ones operating in the other world, right? And this is of course a problem because science doesn't have, like doesn't share this kind of ontology. Science is monist, uh, natural sciences, which means that um, we don't believe that there is like a body and a mind, we reject the idea of a mind and we call the body like the matter, right? So of course, given that behavior analysis is a scientific view, uh, behavior analysis is compromised with this monist view, right? And, and he, like uh, the, the ontology where behavior analysis stands is monist. So let's, like, let's remember that we are not talking about that mind at all. We are gonna cross it out and we are gonna leave it in there. So what's the deal? The deal is that matter, as these, author explain, those, these authors explained, um, matter is organized in different levels of complexity, which means that every level of complexity is actually conformed by the elements of the previous uh, level and the interactions among them. So we have atoms and the idea is that atoms are interacting among each other and that's how you get elements, right? Elements interact among each other and you have molecules and they interact among each other and you have cells and organs and systems and then you get to the organism level and the organism, the organism is able to interact with their context, right? And that was behavior and all that stuff. So the idea is that um, we have artificially created fields to study the phenomena happening in each of these levels. So that's why we have physics, for instance, uh, like physics of particles that study the phenomena located in this place, or we have chemistry, or we have like uh, biology, and then we have psychology, which is the field that studies the relation between the interaction among the organism and the context, right? And behavioral analysis basically like psychology, right? And well, this is the, like I'm gonna summarize the point of my talk in one PowerPoint animation. So please like pay attention because basically what I'm saying in all this talk is that even if medical problems are a phenomenon happening in this level of complexity, Mental disorders are a problem happening in this level of complexity. Um, that's kind of the point of this talk, right? So when I'm saying this, of course, this is not to say that they belong to the Cartesian mind. I'm gonna cross this out like really firmly because that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that they belong to this level of complexity. 
And um, like a friend of mine asked, actually asked me, okay, but if you, um, if that's the case, then why do you, do you call it mental, right? Why do you call it mental if this is not about the mind? And that's actually a really good question and we could discuss it later. Maybe we could call them psychological problems from now on. The only issue here is that sometimes when you say to someone, oh, maybe that problem is psychological, you normally don't mean, oh, maybe the ontology of your problem is not actually situated in this level of complexity, but rather in this one. Normally what people think that they are saying, that your meaning is maybe you're making your problem up. So maybe we could reflect on the kind of implications and what, why if you have a psychological problem, that doesn't mean that it's invented because of course it's happening. It's just in a different level of complexity in terms of the matter, right? Okay, so that's the first thing I'm not saying. The second thing that I'm not saying is that psychological, psychological factors need to be also taken into account. I'm saying this because there are, um, well, maybe you guys heard about the biopsychosocial model. Uh, basically, the idea of this model is that they suggest or highlight that, of course, biology is important, but we also need to take into account other factors, like psychological factors, like stressful events or trauma, or also like social factors, like beauty standards or so, and so on. Um, and this is not what I'm saying. And actually, I want to say that this model is actually quite close to the medical paradigm because um, we can actually see this model like this, right? The thing is that this, like this model is basically saying, okay, beauty standards influence in the kind of symptoms that you're showing, right? But they don't really explain how this influence is happening, right? They don't say, oh, like there's one thing outside which is beauty standards and how that influences on our symptoms, right? Like a behaviorist would say, well, because you learned them, but they don't say that. So the idea is that either you say that it's through learning and then you have the behaviorist view, or you say that it's because they create somehow brain malfunction. And then you have again, the, the medical model, right? Um, so this slide is just to show how um, these two views are kind of saying the same, but just highlighting different parts or aspects. Of the, of the idea, but still you have the biological causing here. While behavior analysis, what they are saying is that the cause is a learning process which is happening in a context from which you cannot separate, be separated. Okay, uh, next thing I'm not saying, I'm not saying that brain and biology are not important. Actually, I really recommend this paper which shows how neuroscience and behavior analysis should be understood as complementary disciplines, right? What I'm saying with all this story is just that mental disorders are happening in a different level than medical disorders. And this is the case because learning processes are a phenomenon happening in this level of complexity because it's the organism, the one that it's learning, right? And this is not to deny that there's a biology underneath that enables this learning. It's like, but this happens with every, any other phenomenon, for instance, immunological response. We can say that that's a phenomenon happening in this level of complexity. And saying that, instead of saying that this belongs in here or something like that, is not to deny that there's a chemical balance happening underneath that enables this to happen. This is just to say that this phenomenon should be understood or conceptualized from this level of complexity, right? Um, okay, maybe at this point of the talk, some of you guys might have already bought the idea of learning because it sounds really cool. So maybe you think that what I'm suggesting in here is that, okay, so learning provokes a biological change that provokes the disorder. And I wanted to clarify, so it would be something like this, right? So you learn, learn stuff like beauty standards or a trauma or bad habits, right? And all of that could be understood as previous causes. And that's the one like provoking the biological cause that provokes the symptoms. And I'm not saying this because what I'm saying is that we are in this level of complexity and you learn these different symptoms and they conform the network that we were talking and you do learn them in order to get adapted in a context, but then in long term, they don't work. That's what I'm saying, right? And of course there are neural correlates happening underneath that, but they are not the cause. That's the model that we are discussing here. Long story short, the idea would be that 
instead, like you have all these levels, right? And you have then the person interacting with the environment. So the idea would be that the problem of mental disorders is not in here, but in here. Um, when I crossed this out, maybe some people thought I was crossing this out when it's not the case. Uh, of course, I'm not saying that learning doesn't imply a biological change. Of course, learning implies a biological change. That's why we talked about neuroplasticity, right? The, the claim is against neural, neural sufficiency principle in the slide that we commented in the past. So the claim is not to say uh, like when you grasp or when you uh, take a glass of water, of course there are like movement, like your muscles are changing and there's movement because if there's movement, you need your muscle changing. changing. This is just to say that, uh, yeah, that you cannot by looking at the movement, get the whole picture of interaction. So that's what I'm saying. But of course, I'm not denying that learning implies a change in biology. And finally, and more importantly, um, learning does not imply that mental disorders are less severe. I mean, the severity of a mental disorder doesn't change according to the conceptualization that we do, right? Um, like the severity is there, it's a fact. Like people die as a consequence of mental disorders. They commit suicide, they suffer a lot they are like they cannot work uh, in some cases, you know, so the severity doesn't change just because of saying that the symptoms were learned instead of biologically provoked, right? Neither this is to say that uh, mental disorders are easily changed. Uh, we can all agree, agree that I learned Spanish and probably it would be impossible for me to unlearn Spanish or something like that, right? Um, sometimes changing a biological part, it's actually easier than learning a new habit. So this is just to say that learning does not imply that you can modify it easily. And neither it means that it was voluntarily learned. Like maybe most of us would have preferred not to learn that in this society in order to be successful you need to be thin and, and all that stuff but we simply learn that because we are part of the society not because we wanted to explicitly make such a learn uh yeah go through that learning process and finally uh, it might be the case that some of the mental disorders that have been traditionally considered as such do not belong in this new conceptualization uh what i'm saying with all of this is that at least some of the ones some of them uh should be understood from this learning perspective. Uh, and well, now I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna leave you some consequences and questions to discuss and we can open the time to all of us discuss about this. Um, first of all, we could reflect on, are we using the right terms, right? We already talked about mental disorders, if it's actually proper, like, are they, like accurate to call them mental disorders. We could do the same with symptoms, right? Uh, because if there's no a biological cause provoking them, that's the definition of symptom, like the observable part when there's a biological cause underneath. So maybe the word symptom is not appropriate either. We could also reflect on animal models because uh, if learning processes are so important, that means that animal models should also model the learning environments in which the organism is uh, embedded, right? And not only like the biology or something like that. Final, like also we could reflect on the role of the pa patient because if the problem is um, learning, the solution is learning something more adapted, right? And I wanted to bring this last recommendation, which is a chapter of a book, which is Responsibility Without Blame, because saying that the patient is actually active in the role, so he has to get engaged into the process so because he has to learn a new and more adapted way is not to say that he's guilty or is not to put blame on him is just to make him responsible of all the process right and finally we could reflect on the pharmacology if it's actually a treatment or is more as an aesthetic in the sense that um, if there's no a biological cause then pharmacology is never going to be targeting a biological cause because there's not such a thing. It's gonna be targeting uh, the symptoms that you suffer, right? And that might be, it's, it's still totally valid and legitimate because uh, sometimes they, um, the symptoms are so bad by themselves that you need to mitigate them. And that's why I used the term anesthetic 
because it's this idea of that sometimes in order to do a surgery, of course you need anesthetic because otherwise the person is not, like you cannot do the surgery, but that doesn't mean that the anesthetic is gonna like solve the problem. It's just gonna enable the person to be in a state in which you can do the change. So the pharmacology maybe should be seen in the same way in mental disorders. And that's it. Uh, this is my mail, but we can discuss now if you want. And I know that I put a lot of references. Uh, so if you want to learn more from this, I'm gonna send them along uh, in an email. And yeah, that's the talk. Thank you very much, Ines, and thank you, Alva, for uh, hosting the questions. Uh, I'm now going to, to close um, and want to refer you to next week. So next week uh, on June 16th, again on uh, Tuesday, we have Dr. Verena Heiser, and she will speak about credibility in neuroscience and ways to make our research findings more robust. She's a member of the advisory uh, board of credibility in neuroscience um, of, the, of the project, uh, which was launched last year by the British Neuroscience Association. So stay tuned for that, for the uh, Be Incredible project uh, next week. And then uh, moving on, I just posted a link actually in the discussion of the, the Zoom session. So if you click on that, you'll get to our LinkedIn alumni group, uh, which is exclusive for attendees of our lectures. And the main purpose of this group is sort of like give you the opportunity to, con to connect with fellow early career scientists, to engage in discussions and share interesting articles and links. We know that especially right now during this time of quarantine, it's really hard to like maintain connections and uh, do networking since a lot of those conferences are canceled. So this is a great way for you to communicate with anyone else who is joining these sessions uh, on a professional level on LinkedIn. Uh, the link again is in the discussion. Um, and finally, do not hesitate to contact us if there's any topic you want uh, us to cover uh, and we do our best to, um, to organize speakers and make it happen.